finding from us this evening, technology on the cutting edge. We were interested today to hear that more than 100 law enforcement officials in Mexico are having microchips implanted in their arms. The chips allow a person to be scanned, sort of like a cereal box at the supermarket checkout. In Mexico, this will be one more tool in the fight against crime. Here's ABC's John McKenzie. You've seen it before, right out of Hollywood. It's maybe a little uncomfortable. A microchip inside the body. A hidden, high-tech identification tag. They have the access codes to your job spot. Now, Mexico's Attorney General and 160 of his deputies have had microchips in... Unfortunately, the modern church's reliance on their pastors to spoon-feed them just the Babylonian-approved Cliff Notes version of End Times Prophecy has put them in the most dangerous position possible, where they think they know what the mark is, and they are ready to strap on the old army helmet and go down in a blaze of fire in rejecting it, when in reality most of them have in fact already willingly received the mark of the beast in their church a long time ago. Now, if you ask people whether or not they have been given the mark of God upon their hands and as frontlets between their eyes, they'll probably have no idea what you're talking about. Well, guess what? Everyone pretty much has a mark already, whether they know it or not. And our eternal fate rests on whose mark you have. Now, just to get this out of the way, I'm not a Lutheran, a Calvinist, a Mormon. I'm not working for Baptists, Catholics, Evangelicals, Jews, or Adventists. I'm just a dude who can read what the scriptures say. So don't think I'm here to convince you to go to some church. I myself am not into playing church. I'm just here to share what the word itself says so that whosoever has ears can be at least aware of which mark they may have received. So what is a mark anyways? If you go outside a church and do a survey of people coming out of what the mark of the beast is, you'll probably get answers like, it's a barcode tattoo on your forehead, or it's a, it's a microchip implant that the New World Order will use to track us. Or if you go to like a heavy metal concert and ask what the mark of the beast is, They'll give you those devil horns and they'll growl, The mark of the beast is sex, sex, sex. Why don't we actually know what the mark of the beast is for sure? Because we haven't actually read the book. Out of sloth, we have based our beliefs upon what other people have told us. We don't want to read the book. We instead would just ask our uncle, who will regurgitate what his pastor has regurgitated, what he has learned from his seminary professor, who has regurgitated to his class what he has learned in systematic theology books and denominational commentaries, which were written by guys who twisted what they had read in the scriptures to line up through the wavy goggles of whatever denomination they were trying to defend. By the time we, the sheeple, actually get a taste of it, the food has already been eaten digested and excreted and then eaten again and digested and excreted many, many, many times before it ever comes to our plate. A lot of times when you dig through what a professional preacher has regurgitated to you, you're going to find all kinds of things besides the scriptures that someone else has eaten and gotten into the mix way back the line someplace. In other words, by the time the word gets to us, it has been corrupted. We should rather eat the word of God fresh for ourselves and see how much healthier we turn out to be. And we all have the ability to do that. We all have access to the scriptures. Now, Revelation is the last chapter in the Bible, and it is expected that whosoever reads it has already become intimate with all that led up to it in the rest of the book. As for the mark, there are actually a lot of places in the scripture where people are given marks, both good marks and bad marks. You know, a lot of people get confused and they get scared 
when they try to read Revelation because it seems so foreign and strange to them. Now, most folks don't realize that the bulk of the information in Revelation is merely explaining, quoting, and echoing things laid out thoroughly and in detail in the Old Testament. You can't hardly get through even a single verse in Revelation without hitting a reference or even a direct quote of the Old Testament. We have no need to argue what Revelation is communicating if we simply let the scriptures define its own terminology. Revelation speaks of two different marks. In the English, one is called the seal of God and the other one is what we call the mark of the beast. So let's turn back to the foundation of the scriptures and see what the mark of the Lord is first so that we can begin to grasp what the mark of the beast concept is. The word mark in English, according to Merriam-Webster, means to designate, to make or leave a mark onto, or to label. In Hebrew, there are several different words that can mean mark. In Genesis chapter 4, Yahweh sets a mark upon Cain. The original Hebrew word used here is oath, which basically means a sign, a signal, or a distinguishing mark. Now this mark uh, in the Hebrew oath mentioned here is an example of a bad mark, one that you don't want to get. However, the same Hebrew word oath can also be used to describe a good mark. We, we read uh, several places in De Deuteronomy about a good elf that we bind upon our hands and put as frontlets in between our eyes. The English word for elf here is sign. The same Hebrew word that was used to describe the mark of Cain can also be used in this context to describe a good kind of mark, like the mark or the sign of God. Another Hebrew word for mark is shamar and can also have good or bad connotations. In Job chapter 10, it reads, If I sin, then thou markest me, and thou wilt not acquit me from my iniquity. Like the mark of the beast, this is a, a, an example of a bad mark, whereas the same exact word in Psalm 37 can be a good one. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. In Scripture, a mark can also be a sign of exemption from judgments as well. Like in Ezekiel chapter 9, the direct parallel to the seal of God situation given in Revelation. And we'll look at that one later. Now you may have heard that the mark of the beast is the number 666, and that this number can be found in use within the UPC barcode system. How this works is uh, when the laser reads the binary computer language encoded into the lines of the UPC label on your cereal box at the checkout line. The first number six is on the edge of the UPC with the slightly longer lines. That is what turns on the computer. In the middle of the UPC, there's another six that uh, the barcode tells the computer to switch characteristics. And then the last six at the end of the barcode turns it off again. Many point out that this same binary code in the UPC is embedded into the radio frequency identification microchips, also called RFID, which are gaining popularity in the world as a new possible form of ID. These RFID microchips would be implanted under your skin, like in your hand or in your forehead, and they would be used for all forms of ID and for monetary transaction. Now let's, uh, let's slow down and take a close look at exactly what the book of Revelation says about this mark of the beast. Now let's uh let's slow down and take a close look at exactly what the book of Revelation says about this mark of the beast. Now we need to pay very close attention to what is being written here. Revelation chapter 13. It's starting at like verse 16. This is the big uh, place where it talks about the number 666 and it talks about the mark of the beast and a lot of other things. This is what people always quote. 
Let's read it slowly and carefully. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So here is a mark received in the right hand or in the forehead that will be needed to buy or sell. Now, does this passage say that the mark of the beast is 666? We need to pay very close attention to the word or here. The, the Greek word here for uh, the word or is e. This word is a distinctive conjunction used to distinguish things or thoughts which either mutually exclude each other or one of which can take the place of the other. So if you slow down and look carefully, this passage is actually making a distinction between three separate things. One, the mark of the beast. Two, another separate thing, the name of the beast. And three, the number of his name. The word or here indicates these three things are to be separated so that we can distinguish one from the others. Let's examine the number 666. What does this passage say that 666 is referring to? Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number, not the mark of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. So what is 666? It says right here that it is the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and this number is 666. If we want to understand what the mark is, we have to read very carefully. Now later in chapter 14, there seems to be a link between the mark and the name of the beast. But we have to first completely understand what's being described here so that we can get the full picture. So we uh, know that according to Revelation chapter 13, the mark of the beast is not merely the number 666. 666 is specifically the number of his name, not the mark of the beast. After closely examining this text, the hypothesis that the mark of the beast will simply be an implanted UPC type computer chip with the 666 ingrained into it doesn't hold water, at least not by itself. There is more to this than meets the eye. In order to understand what the mark of the beast is, we need to look earlier in Revelation to see what the other mark is. We're going to see what is called in the English the seal or the sfragizo of God. The, the Greek word sfragizo, I might be saying that wrong, I'm not a Greek guy, means to set a mark upon, like the impressing of a seal. In this verse, in the English, it is translated as seal, but it is defined in Strong's Concordance as a distinguishing mark. So a seal in the English is actually mark in the Greek. So it's pretty much the same word. Revelation chapter 7. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal, the mark, of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God 
in their foreheads. So we have two groups of people described here. Those with the mark of God and those with the mark of the beast. Everyone will have a mark one way or the other. And only those with the mark of God in their foreheads will be spared. Now you hear a lot of talk about refusing the mark of the beast, but you don't hear a whole lot of talk about receiving the mark of God. What people think is that by merely refusing the mark of the beast, that they will be good to go. But it doesn't work that way. Anyone who isn't sealed in their foreheads with the mark of God will by default have the mark of the beast. No one will be holding them down on a table and forcing them to get it. They're just going to have it. So are we going to have a bunch of people with computer chips marked 666 in their foreheads and then a different group of good people with the number 777 in the computer chips in their foreheads? Something seems a little weird about this, doesn't it? What does this uh, mean to be marked or sealed in the foreheads and in the right hands? Well, let us not grope around in the dark. Let us flip on the light switch of the scriptures to know exactly what this means. I have not yet seen any pastor in any religious denomination who has accurately relayed what the scriptures say on this topic. It's almost as, as if they all fell in love with the same uh, Left Behind novels or Van Impe TV shows. Or maybe they all went to the same seminary or something. It, you know, Babylon means confusion. And it should be no surprise that those who work for Babylon would be confused. So let us read what the scriptures identify as the mark of God. So that we may no longer be blind. Let's turn on the light switch together. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And thou shalt bind them for a sign, an oath, a mark, upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Now what is this mark we are to bind on our hands and as frontless between our eyes? Well, let's read the whole statement. All right, back up to the beginning here. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 1. We're trying to find out what this mark is on our foreheads and our hands. Now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded you to teach, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. You keep going on here. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them, these words, for a sign, for a mark, an oath, upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So what's this mark that we are to bind upon our hearts and on our hands and on our foreheads? They are those words which he commanded us, his commandments. Now some of the Jews took this command literally and actually made little leather boxes called phylacteries that contained little scrolls of Torah passages like Exodus 13 and the passage we just read here, and they strapped them onto their foreheads and onto their hands. Now, if they really wanted to get literal, they would have had to have cut themselves open and install some of those phylacteries into their hearts as well. You know, it says it's in their hearts too, so maybe they could stuff it in the left ventricle someplace. I don't know. Now, was this passage really telling them to strap the commandments onto their foreheads? Or was Yahweh trying to communicate something a little more profound than that? Now, was this passage really telling them to strap the commandments onto their foreheads? Or was Yahweh trying to communicate something a little more profound than that? 
putting his commandments into our heart makes sense to us. We use that same metaphor today. But how about the one on the foreheads and on the hands? Now, we don't use that one very much anymore, so let me explain it. The frontlets between the eyes is where the frontal lobe of your cerebral cortex is. That's the part of your brain that is the emotional control center and the home to your personality. That's where you have complex thought and reasoning. To put the commandments here would be to constantly cycle them through your complex thought processes and reasoning until they became a part of your personality. Okay, so this is finally starting to make sense now, right? Well, how about the right hand deal? What's that talking about? Well, the right hand is generally recognized across the world as the part of the body that you do your work with. So putting the word of God into your mind and then also in your hand means that you actually do or live his word in real life, not just merely think about it. Remember that faith without works is dead. If we have fully let God's word become integrated into our personality, it will show through our hands our works. Now, I'm not saying that you earn your way to heaven through works. What I am saying, and what the scriptures say, that if you truly fall in love with God and his word, it becomes a part of you, and you will live the word of God, and people will see it in your works. Now, this same concept of the commandments of God being marked on his people's hands and in their foreheads is reiterated again in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Also, in uh, Exodus 13, it is stressed, that the feast of unleavened bread shall also be for a sign upon thy hand and for a memorial between thine eyes. There's another mark of the Lord that is mentioned in the Old Testament, and those are the weekly Sabbaths, which are to be the distinguishing mark and banner of his people who joyfully keep it in remembrance of how Yahweh rested after the six-day creation of the universe. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. In short, the scriptures themselves define the mark of God to be the living and breathing of his entire word, ingraining his law into our hearts or minds and actions keeping all his statutes and talking about him and his love all the day long from when we get up in the morning till when we lie down at night. So now we have a better idea of what Revelation 7 is talking about when it says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. This is being sealed in his word to where it has actually become our personality and we act out his word through our hands. Okay, now that we've uh, seen what the scriptures define as a mark and what the mark of the Lord is, we can now move on and examine the mark of the beast. We know two things about this mark according to uh, Revelation chapter 13. One, it will also be in the right hand and in the foreheads. And two, if you don't have this mark, you won't be allowed to buy or sell. And even though we determined by close examination in this passage that the mark of the beast and the number of his name, 666, are two mutually exclusive or different things, Revelation 14 indicates that there's still a link. Revelation 14 says, And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name... The number of his name is 666, right? Well, how can this be if we just read in chapter 13 that the mark of the beast and the number of his name are two separate things? What's going on here? This is why we must read more than just these single isolated verses. In the beginning of Revelation in chapter 3, Messiah says, Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. 
So here we see that when you choose to follow a god, you take that god's name and it's written on you in, the, in this very same figurative sense that we examined with the seal of God. So when we see in Revelation 14 those who receive the mark of his name, it's synonymous with the mark of the beast language. Those who follow Yahweh will have his name written upon them, and those who follow the beast will have the name of the beast written on them. Now, a lot of folks really want to insist on the literal interpretation here, and we'll get into that in a little bit. I think there's literal and figurative elements to most of these proper, uh, prophecies. But what we got to remember is that although a lot of prophecy is given in literal terms, much of it is very figurative and uses figurative symbolism, usually rooted in the Old Testament language. Like when we read Revelation, how it describes the four horsemen of apocalypse riding across the sky, it's not talking about four huge, literal 80,000 ton flying horses. And when it talks about the mark of his name in Revelation chapter 14, it's not talking about people walking around with 666 written with a big permanent marker on their foreheads. No one would fall for that one. And Satan's a little trickier than that. He would like it if we really thought that's all it was. Because then, as long as we don't have 666 on our heads, we must be good to go, right? Wrong. This passage is trying to explain something a lot more profound and deep than God condemning a new way to do credit card transactions. I mean, come on. Now, I do think there probably will be RFID chips, and I'll explain why in a, in a little bit later. Well, if we want to understand exactly what the mark of the beast is, we have to know who the beast is in the first place. We know what the Bible says a mark is, right? So now let's see what the beast is. Who is the beast again? Well, regardless of what anyone's uncle says, the scriptures define exactly who the beast is. Here's a quick recap of the bad characters of Revelation real fast. First, we have Babylon, the entire world empire unified against God, both the religious and the political aspects. Then we have the dragon, which is pretty much Satan. Then we have a harlot woman, which represents Satan's mystery religion which he sells to the masses as Christianity, but in reality it's just modified Babylonian paganism. This same woman rides a scarlet-colored beast with seven heads and ten horns, which is really just another description of the dragon. Now, as defined in the scriptures, the consecutive heads of this beast represent the seven major world empires that down through the times give the most significant support to Babylon's mystery idolatry. It is actually uh, chapter 17's Scarlet Beast that most clearly incorporates all of Revelation's beast into one. So the beast here pretty much represents both the religious and political aspects of Babylon the Great, or you could say the entire apostate world system in which we live. From its TV programming and pop culture to its industrial military complex and even the Antichrist himself. So what is the mark of this beast? Well, we know what a mark is now. It's taking on the character, thoughts, and actions of the one in whom you serve. If all you can think of is how to better love and serve Yahweh, and it's ingrained into your mind, and you're showing that love by the fruit of your hands, you have his mark or seal. Now, by contrast, if all you can think of is about the things of this world, and you take on its character, thoughts, and actions, you have the mark of the beast in your mind and in your right hands. And when this great time of trouble comes, only those who are in with the world will be able to participate with it. There's going to be laws and statutes passed that will force you to pick in whom you serve, Yahweh or the beast. Once this great shakeup takes place, the world will declare war on the true followers of Yahweh, they're going to be blamed for everything that goes wrong. I mean, if a lady trips over a banana peel in the Walmart parking lot, it'll be blamed on those terrible followers of Yahweh. They're going to construct laws, just like Hitler did back in the 30s with the Jews, that will be designed to exclude Yahweh's people from society. 
and you are not going to be able to buy or sell or get a job or go to school or even get food stamps unless you get back on board with this new Babylon's great system. However, getting on board with this wonderful system will require you to live in ways that will cause you to neglect God's law. That could be anything from forced labor on the Sabbath or not being allowed to celebrate Yahweh's feast as he instructed, or it could even be that you have to watch the image of the new world idol on the TV every week. We'll see soon enough. Ah, we're already trained to worship our American idols, so it, it won't be that big of a leap. Most Christians in America who think that they will not accept the mark of the beast already wear it on their sleeves by the way that they act and treat people. They already have it in their forehead when they're thinking about and taking on the personality and character of the beast that they see depicted by the actors on their favorite TV shows. They already pretty much worship the beast in their churches by bowing down in submission to the overt paganism they've allowed to come into their midst. They take on the mark of the beast by default when they can't bring themselves to cry out against the abominations they see within their own camps. Every Christian church I've ever visited commits gross acts of adultery against their god with ancient pagan gods at least once, sometimes twice a year. We have completely forsaken the signs given to us by our true God. And we've allowed Babylon to replace them with the signs of their pagan gods. We don't celebrate the accomplishments of Yahweh anymore. We instead celebrate the accomplishments of ancient heathen gods and then say we're doing it for him. This is the reason why most Western Christians have such a hard time admitting the scriptural truth as to what the mark is. It's way easier to ignore the various marks of the Lord and pretend like the mark of the beast is only a computer chip. We don't want to repent of our idolatry. We don't want to walk the narrow path alone. We want to follow all our fellow sheep down the broad path that leads to destruction. Now, I'm not saying that there will never be an RFID chip that Babylon will try to force people to take. I bet they will do that. But this is not what these passages were focusing on. In, for many, the idea of a computer implant is way less scary than the idea of actually following what Yahweh has really instructed us to do. To come out of Babylon and to get away from all the crap. To get away from all the gross fornication that their churches have made the highlights of their year. The fact remains... Yahweh wants us to live in his love, as he has made clear in his instructions. When we make his word as the frontlets between our eyes and act out his love by reaching out to our neighbors with our right hands, then we will be sealed in him and we will be safe from the judgments to come. Now, we can choose to believe that we think we can merely fight off the computer chip squads with our shotguns while strapping a bucket over our heads like a helmet. But the truth is probably that we don't really want to let go of all those things that actually mark us as being one with the beast. God is a lot more concerned with where our hearts and minds are than how we do our visa transactions. Now, if they try to tell me that I've got to get this microchip someday, I'll tell them they have no authority over me, that Messiah is my authority, and that his authority is Yahweh. And if they really want to kill me over something stupid like that, well, that's no big deal. I know where I'm going. But I will not be deceived into thinking that that's where the real danger lies. The real mark of the beast is not just in a chip. It's in where your thoughts dwell and in how well you treat your brother through your right hand in your actions. Okay, now all that being said, I do think we will see an RFID implant introduced. The technology has been developed and the infrastructure is in place. There's no denying that. And if it's introduced, it will be one of the peripherals of the B system 
and should therefore not be taken. But this is only one really small, tiny part of the big picture. This very well may be one of the mechanisms by which the beast controls who buys or sells. But you can still have the mark of the beast even if you refuse the chip. Remember, it's much larger than that. Remember back in World War II, there was uh, before D-Day, I think it was the Allies dressed up this dead guy like a CIA agent, and then they threw him into the ocean with his briefcase full of all these fraudulent documents that were intended to throw off the Germans as to the true plans of the Allies' invasion. Well, the Germans found this dude floating in the water, looked like a CIA guy. He had all these uh, documents talking about this invasion, and they bought it. They bought the decoy. And the U.S. and the Allies pulled off a successful invasion in Normandy. Now, if the U.S. government can pull off an effective decoy, Satan can too. If we all think we can win an easy ticket to heaven by taking the pissed cowboy approach of merely fighting against the government-imposed microchip, then we have been successfully duped. God wants his word implanted into our hearts, minds, and actions, not the culture and religion of the beast of this world. I think the RFID implant pushed by the governments is a concerted effort on the part of Satan to be a huge distraction from the greater mark of the beast. Now, many of your pastors will try to tell you that we are not supposed to keep the law anymore. That's been done away with. And if, I suppose if you really think that's the case, then you should just go down to the strip club and have a good time. A lot of folks think it's impossible to keep the law. Well, people really only say that because they have God's law all mixed up with man's law. The religious laws that your churches try to force on you are difficult to keep. But Yahweh's law, in his word, are not that hard. You'd be surprised to know the things that your churches say you need to do that are not mentioned anywhere in the scriptures. They really like lording over you. Yahweh's law is love and is designed to actually free you from the clutches of other people who would like to boss you around. Now, if you, like me, have grown up in this Babylon world system, you probably have been grossly misinformed into what Yahweh's requirements even are. His law is love. It's not meant to restrict our freedom. It is meant to give us freedom from the ravages of living in sin. If you think keeping the law would be a burden or unpleasant, you don't understand what the law really is. Your, your church has lied to you as to the character of Yahweh and what his law actually is. His words are life. They're sweet as honey. They offer true peace and happiness in this life. The local laws in your city are way more of a burden to keep than his laws are. Now, before you say, the hell with it all, it's too hard. Allow me to take you on a quick walk through the actual instructions of my Father in Heaven. You may be surprised as to what's in there and what's not in there. Peace.